The question is, as on the order paper, nobody indicating... Oh, Sir Peter Bottomley, Father of the House. Mr Speaker, I seldom speak on these procedural motions. I don't think they're always justified. I think this one is. It's not a time to go into the merits of the bill, but to say that there are many of us who would like to use it as a Christmas tree, I, for example, on the frozen overseas pensioners, others perhaps on universal credit. But I think in this case it's justified to try to get this major, in my view, necessary change through Parliament under a strict guillotine and then get on with doing what we can to help pensioners in other ways. Anybody else wishing to contribute? I see none. So the question is as on the order papers. Many of that opinion say aye. Aye. Don't you know? I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Social Security Operating Bill, Operating of Benefits Bill, Second Reading. Now. Uh, a recent uh, amendment in the name of Edge Davy has been selected to move the second reading. I am right on that, aren't I? Minister to move. Sorry, but the minister is is moving straight away. So the minister to move. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I beg to move the bill be read a second time. Each year, I am required to undertake a review of social security rates to consider whether benefits have kept pace with inflation or increase in earnings. I will undertake that review shortly and report to Parliament in November. The bill before us today refers to how I will undertake that review. As set out in the 1992 Social Security Administration Act, there are four benefits which up for where there is a direct link to earnings. The basic state pension, the new state pension, the standard minimum guarantee and pension credit, and survivors' benefits and industrial death benefit. The last benefit is devolved to Scotland, and I can confirm that we have received the legislative consent motion necessary. I must emphasise that this bill does not extend to other benefits, including universal credit, where the uprating review is linked to prices. Um, normally, I consider a specific reference period to consider earnings growth as part of my review. That same earnings reference period has been used for the past decade. And in re preparing for the review last year with regard to that reference period, we anticipated and saw an unprecedented fall in average earnings as a result of the COVID restrictions we introduced to protect lives, especially the most vulnerable, including many pensioners, and protect the NHS. That is why we changed the law for one year to set aside the earnings link, else state pensions would have remained frozen. I then made the assessment and awarded an up rating of 2.5%, which was higher than the then inflation rate of 0.5%. As I prepare for this year's review, the economic context is very different to last year, as our economy and businesses have reopened following our successful vaccination programme and unprecedented support for businesses and households. Millions of people have moved off furlough back into work, and we are witnessing a surge in the labour market with over a million job vacancies. The combination of these has resulted in a distorting effect on wages with a statistical anomaly. Confirmed figures will be published in October, but provisional ONS figures shows an increase in earnings of 8.3%, which is over two percentage points higher than at any time over the last two decades. Given this statistical spike in earnings is down to a COVID-related distortion, I am seeking the agreement of Parliament to again set aside the earnings link for just one more year, 2022-23. And I have put this on the face of the bill to award the higher of inflation or 2.5%, applying in effect again a double lock policy. The triple lock policy will be applied in the usual way from next year for the remainder of the Parliament. This approach has been strongly recommended by external commentators, including Sir Steve Webb, the Liberal Democrat Pensions Minister for the lifetime of the Coalition Government. And while it has come as no surprise to most of us in this House, I was disappointed at the amendment tabled by the Liberal Democrats finding the latest bandwagon to jump on. And they really should listen to Sir Steve, who probably knows more about pensions than anybody in the Liberal Democrats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, this government is committed to ensuring that older people can enjoy their retirement with security, dignity and respect. And since 2010, the full yearly basic stamp pension has increased by over £2,050 in cash terms. And there are 200,000 fewer pensioners in absolute poverty, both before and after housing costs than in 2019. I am proud of our record on support for pensioners and of the action we took last year to ensure that pensioners' incomes continue to increase. This bill will ensure a temporary statistical anomaly in wages does not unfairly track across into pensions, while also preserving the spending power of pensioners 
protecting them from increases in the cost of living, I beg to move. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Mr Matt Rodder. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. With the leave of the House, I would like to respond. While this bill seems a technical piece of legislation, it does raise fundamental questions about this government and, indeed, the trust it enjoys with people across the country. I want to address a number of issues today. The substance of the bill, how it's part of a pattern of behaviour, the changes we would like to see to protect pensioners, and finally, the context of wider government policy towards the most vulnerable in our society. Turning first to the substance of the bill, today we are being asked to vote for a change in the law to suspend the earnings-related part of the triple lock for one year while retaining the link to prices and the commitment to raise the state pension by a minimum of 2.5%. This, Mr Speaker, is a very important issue and one which directly affects millions of people today and also the value of state pensions for future generations. Mr Deputy Speaker, Labour supports the triple lock. Indeed, all major parties committed to maintain the triple lock in the 2019 general election. I should add that it was a Labour government in 2002 which committed to raising the state pension by the higher of 2.5% and inflation. It's also important to note that taking inflation into account, state pensions rose more on average under Labour, the last Labour government that is, than under both the coalition and the co Conservative governments. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has distorted the earnings growth figures for this year, and the impact of the furlough scheme and the distribution of jobs lost in the crisis has artificially inflated the headline earnings growth figure. The government has said that it expects earnings to be above 8% as a result of this anomaly. We've been clear that the government cannot be allowed to use the current crisis as a smokescreen to break their word to, to pensioners and abolish the triple lock by the back door. We accept that the pandemic has distorted the earnings data. We knew this problem was coming, and surely it's not beyond the wit of the Treasury to, found a, to have found a solution to the anomaly in wage data which maintained the link to earnings and offered certainty for pensioners. I'm afraid the government has failed to be open about the earnings data it is using, and it's failed to show it's concerned about lower income pensioners. It's asking us to vote on trust alone, something I'm afraid this government does not enjoy very much of. By downgrading the triple lock, the government is breaking a manifesto promise. Trust in the government has been badly damaged. I shouldn't have to say this, but given the history of the Prime Minister and his government, I want to set out what the House and the public have a right to expect. Over the last months, we've seen a series of actions which show that the government doesn't understand, and I'm afraid, in some cases, just doesn't seem to care. Mr Deputy Speaker, this should be obvious, Sadly, it doesn't seem to be to the Prime Minister and his administration. Today's broken promise is the third breach of trust in just a few months, and this is starting to be a pattern of behaviour. First, there was the cut to overseas aid, which the government made despite a wide range of opposition. I should say, as the only G7 country to cut aid, breaking a manifesto commitment to support the world's poorest and most vulnerable people. The Conservative government retreated from a moral duty. This has already weakened the UK's position at the G7 summit and will continue to do so for up-and-coming summits on education and COP26. And I should add that Parliament has repeatedly made clear it does not support aid cuts and that Britain must not turn its back on the world's poorest. I would add that the Labour government will, par will build partnerships with other governments, civil society groups and communities to overcome global challenges by using the aid budget to tackle poverty and inequality. Secondly, there was the breach of trust we saw last week when the government broke its promise not to raise national insurance. The government had already weakened social care and our NHS, cutting £8 billion and leaving us with long A&E, cancer and mental health waits, even before the pandemic. Their solution, when finally pushed to act by the coronavirus pandemic, an unfair tax on, well, on jobs, the biggest tax rise on families for over 50 years. And then with the cuts to the universal credit in the government's sites, it seems that the government is going after the very same people time and time again. A tax rise that hits less well-off areas, so much for levelling up. The CBI, the Federation of Small Business and the British Chambers of Commerce have all criticised this, this the NI rise, as illogical and harmful to business and to our recovery. And now, Mr Deputy Speaker, we face the third broken promise on the triple lock, when ministers have consistently said they would protect it. 
I would like to repeat at this stage that the government must not use this crisis as a way of leaving the door open to scrapping the triple lock altogether. We recognise on this side of the House that the pandemic has caused an anomaly in the earnings data, and crucially, we are not calling for an 8% rise in the state pension. But the government must come clean and show why they cannot calculate the underlying earnings growth over a longer period of time. They have not adequately made the case why an earnings link with this year's anomaly cannot be resolved, cannot be maintained. Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to briefly turn to what the government should be doing. At the very least, ministers should have maintained an earnings link. They should explain their decision and they should offer binding commitments to protect the triple lock. And they should protect the incomes of less well-off pensioners. There's nothing in the legislation before us which seeks to increase the uptake of tax credits or indeed set out other steps the government will take to protect low-income pensioners. The public and we as the opposition expect them to have looked at this thoroughly, to have been diligent and to treat people fairly. When the Secretary of State first informed the House of her decision, my honourable friend, the member for Sally Bridge and Hyde, asked the government to publish the reasons for this decision. It was the least pensioners could expect. Governments should explain the evidence used to make key policy decisions. Evidence-based policymaking has been a central plank of good governance for a very long time. Sadly, no answers were forthcoming, but perhaps we'll see some actual evidence in this debate. The government's track record, however, on the use of evidence doesn't offer much hope. Finally, Mr Speaker, I'd like to make reference to an amendment which was tabled by two members on the other side of the House. The amendment put down by the right honourable members for Chingford and Wood Green and for Ashford, and I would like to pay tribute to them. On this side of the House, we're deeply concerned about the cut to universal credit and the devastating impact it could have. It will hit thousands of families, many in work, including nurses, teaching assistants and supermarket workers. And I know for experience in my own constituency that 9,000 people in the constituency of Reading East will be affected. Like other colleagues across the House, I have spoken to residents who are desperate and who do not know how they will cope. I will give way. I thank the honourable member. Whilst the temporary increase to universal credit has come to an end, surely he would welcome the permanent increase to the local housing allowance, the work allowance, the above inflation increases on the national living wage mm. and the changes to income yeah, tax threshold. Yeah, yeah. Will he welcome those? Are you still a minister, Justin? I'm, I'm grateful for his intervention, actually, and I understand that, he's fr that the government have frozen the housing allowance. So we look forward to discussing this further in this debate today. As I was saying, thank you, if I may, if I may, the government has left it too late to do the right thing, left it late to do the right thing and end the cut, but it is not too late. There clearly is a strength of feeling across the House on both the universal credit cut and the state pension uplift. In summary, Mr Speaker, I think we agree that trust is very important and it's the basis of good government. The government faces letting pensioners, the country and the country down if it ploughs on with these unfair and unexplained changes without any explanation, reassurance about the future or assessment of the impact on many pensioners. We've now seen three successive breaches of trust in just a few weeks, the last few only days apart. Trust in this government has fallen dramatically and will fall even further if they fail to listen. Mr Deputy Speaker, we are making a very important decision today, but the government can still correct some of its mistakes if it listens to its own backbenchers as well as the advice of the opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you very much. Ian Duncan-Smith. Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm uh, grateful to be called as early as this. And, uh, can I start by saying uh, I am a huge admirer and supporter of my right honourable friend on the front bench. She knows this. Uh, uh, and I have uh, some personal views on this, which I'm going to explain. I tabled the amendment deliberately because I felt that we do need to debate what is the right level of investment into universal credit. And the first point I wanted to make in this, having tabled it, and I have to say from the beginning, I um, otherwise support the idea that the government has to uh, make changes to the uh, triple lock. Uh, there are, what goes missing in a lot of these debates, of course, is the fact that we've just suffered the biggest blow to the economy. I accept that fully. COVID, we sort of debate these things without realising that, and I recognise this. So it does change the terms of the debate. I think it also term, uh, changes the terms of the debate with regards to manifestos, because no manifesto could have predicted the kind of crisis that we've just been through. So we need to get a, a rational and stable debate about these things. And <clears throat> it's important, therefore, recognizing the amount that we have done to pensioners. Uh, we've done a huge amount since the arrival of the triple lock. Pensioner increases have been remarkable and 
so many more have been lifted out of poverty. So these are success stories that I think the government uh, should be able to talk about and recognise there has to be some flexibility. So I'm not going to get up at odds with the government on this at all. Quite the contrary, I recognise that fully. I do, however, want to speak to the amendment that I laid and uh, the honourable gentleman and uh, my uh, right honourable friend I do feel that it is necessary for us to re-examine, therefore, the investment levels in universal credit. I recognise the government's uh, made the right decision at the beginning of the pandemic to invest in universal credit to ensure that those who were naturally going to be falling unemployed as a result of the problems that came uh, from the pandemic uh, would actually receive a higher level of support. Now, I do want to say from the beginning that um, when I resigned from the job that my right honourable friend now holds, um, I did so on uh, two or three particular bases, but the number one basis that I did was that uh, the then uh, Treasury took a significant sum of money, something in the order of the much the same as the uplift, uh, out of universal credit. I always made this point very early on, that with universal credit, when you put the money into it, you are investing in a dynamic process. It is a process that, by its very nature, reduces the overall cost, because the more you get into work, the lower the overall cost of the money that you actually put in comes to. Yes. In passing reference, um, you will remember that your amendment wasn't selected. Passing reference to it, fine, but not in detail, please. Well, I understood, Mr. Speaker, that it's on the order paper, and thus it's on the order paper. I have a right at least to speak to that amendment, even though it wasn't selected. Uh, no, uh, you've got that wrong you're not allowed to speak to an amendment that has not been selected. You can make passing reference to it in the generality in a second reading debate. That's fine. Uh, but uh, um, in detail, no. Well, I'm going to make passing reference to it in that case. Uh, uh, I will do so, and I leave the chair to decide whether or not that passing reference is more of a substantial. So, as I say, I shall pass through universal credit carefully uh, uh, and make full reference, of course, to the... Uh, the statement that's been made or the passing of the second reading in here. I, I do want to make that a very simple point, and I'm not going to hold the House for too long. I do think the point uh, of the amendment that I tried to make, which wasn't selected, uh, and the purposes today, is to ensure that those who are of working age, who are receiving security support and benefit from this government, actually get the right level of support, uh, and that is a case. Now, we know now that the changes made uh, to the triple lock will ensure, therefore, that there is a saving made to the Exchequer against what was unpredictable at the time and resulting from uh, the increase in uh, the level of pay that's going to take place as a result of the COVID restrictions and the bounce back that's taking place. And I recognise that fully. But I do recognise that one of the problems we've got uh, with uh, the result of that is that those of working age are going to have to pick up a bigger burden. And that's why this uh, uplift to universal credit uh, itself, uh, I think, should be reviewed and reviewed very quickly. And the point I simply make, in line with the idea that the pensions are taking some of this burden, is that universal credit itself, if that money is moved or some of it is moved towards the tapers, then what we will have is a reality that more people will move into work. And I hope my right honourable friend, in her discussions with the Treasury in these matters, will make the point to them uh, that they do need to make sure that those in universal credit are able to move through universal credit faster and therefore investment in the tapers in this regard would benefit both the treasury and those who are themselves seeking to get work by making that pathway easier. That will complement what is being done for pensioners at the moment, Mr Speaker, uh, under these terms of the ending of the triple lock for one year, but it will almost certainly uh, be beneficial and mean that this winter and into the spring, whilst we see the effects of the fallout of moving from the furlough scheme and the other difficulties of energy pricing uh, and some of the food pricing that's going to rise, that, that protects those who are most vulnerable whilst giving them an opportunity, which is the very best way, that work is the very best way out of poverty. I'm going to finish here, Mr Speaker, by simply saying that I think this is an important matter and I hope my right honourable friend will take the amendment that we placed, which wasn't called, as a justification for her negotiations with the Treasury to secure a better investment in the taper. David Linden. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, it's a pleasure to follow the right honourable gentleman. Um, I rise to speak in favour of the reasoned amendment and I commit the SNP to voting for it uh, when the House divides this evening. 
Um, as well as uh, speaking to the right honourable gentleman for Kingston and Surbiton's amendment, I want to comment on the broader principles of the bill uh, before the House tonight. Now, I am conscious that for those watching our proceedings, uh, this will be perhaps a, a, an opportunity when they are unaware of the, the consequences of passing this legislation this evening, especially flushing it all through in the space of a couple of hours. In short, as we all know, this is a bill which facilitates this Tory government breaking yet another manifesto commitment, namely breaking the pensions triple lock, which all parties in this chamber committed to at the election less than two years ago. Now, breaking that manifesto pledge follows on from scrapping the commitment to spend 0.7 per cent of GNI on the world's poorest with our international aid budget, and it now comes on top of the new Tory poll tax, which sees hard-working Scots endure a hike in national insurance to pay for sorting out the utter mess of England's health and social care system. But this Prime Minister is not known for keeping his promises, and the decision to suspend the triple lock will have dire consequences for our pensioners. Now, as constituency MPs, we all know that the state pension is by far the largest source of income for UK pensioners, and the triple lock has kept this secure throughout the pandemic. Mr Deputy Speaker, to be blunt, the British Government's decision to break the triple lock promise is a betrayal and an unacceptable attack on pensioners' incomes. What is more, this will do nothing to stop recent indications that more pensioners are indeed living in poverty. We know that relative income, low income, that is the percentage of pensioners in the UK living in households with net disposable income below 60 per cent of the national medium after housing costs, has risen from a historic low of 13 per cent in 2011-12 to 18 per cent in 2019-20. Happy to give way, yes. Thank you, and whilst, um, thanks to my honourable gentleman for giving way. Would you recognise, whilst um, going through this analysis, that actually we did take notice of the needs of pensioners last year, and that the triple lock is reliant on earnings actually being positive, and that last year earnings were negative? And my honourable, right honourable friend on the front bench took that opportunity to raise pensions, despite the fact that the terms of the triple lock were not met at that time. Yeah. <laughs> To the Honourable Lady for, for giving way. And if she pays attention to the rest of the speech, she'll, she'll understand that the reason that I'm developing this argument is because the state pension in the UK is so pitiful, and that, that's the point that I'm addressing. But I'm sure she'll be making that point in her own speech as well. Now, all of this followed a period of over a decade when this measure had been trending downwards from a high of 29% in 1998 1999. So, passing this bill tonight will undo all of that work. Now, although the state pension is the biggest source of income for pensioners, analysis from the House of Commons Library shows that UK state pensions are actually the lowest as a proportion of pre-retirement wages of all of our European neighbours. Pensioners across these islands receive just around a quarter of the average wage when they retire, whereas pensioners in Luxembourg and Austria receive 90 per cent of the average working wage. Now, according to the OECD's latest analysis, the UK has an overall net replacement rate of 28.4 per cent from mandatory pensions eh, for an average earner. So that is well below the OECD average of 58.6 per cent and indeed the EU average of 63.5 per cent. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is simply not right that the UK devotes a smaller percentage of its GDP to state pensions and pensioner benefits than most other advanced economies. So the triple lock is yet another betrayal uh, in a, a Tory-imposed austerity cut. The, the Commons Library for tonight's debate, uh, briefing for tonight's debate estimates that the British government will take away £5 billion from pensioners in 2022-23 if the triple lock elements of the state pension are uprated by the 2.5 per cent rather than 8.3. But investment in the state pension is absolutely crucial, especially as many are still excluded from automatic enrolment in workplace pensions, though I acknowledge that some, but by means nowhere near enough progress, has been made on auto enrolment. And with the time I have tonight, I want to briefly develop that point just a little bit further. Because the British government's failure to extend automatic enrolment to low income earners and young people disproportionately impacts women, worsening the already massive gender pension gap on these islands. And that's before we even come to the issue of the DWP's maladministration with regards to 1950s born women, who quite rightly await to see what stage two of the Ombudsman's process will conclude. And I very much hope that they would do so. I am very happy to give way to my friend. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. I want to echo what he is saying about 1950s women. Is this decision um, to abandon the triple lock not a double injustice 
uh, to the to the waspy women, to the 1950s women, because not only are they now being denied uh, the raise in pension uh, that they might have been expected, they were denied their pension at all at the time that they had originally expected it. Yeah. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for that intervention. He's right, and like me, he will receive regular representations from Rosie Dixon from Waspy Scotland on this matter, and I'm glad that he's put that on Rosie's behalf on the record. Um, now, before I move on, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to touch on frozen pensions. I know that the Father of the House made reference to that at the beginning, uh, certainly at the Business of the House motion consideration. Now, honourable members will be aware that the UK has a series of historical reciprocal agreements uh, providing the uprating of state pension in certain countries. The Government most recently committed to uprating the state pension of UK pensioners in the EEC in the Brexit trade deal. And UK pensioners in other countries such as the USA, Philippines, Israel and Jamaica continue to receive their full payments. However, this arbitrary system means that pensioners in other countries and even indeed in British overseas territories such as the Falkland Islands have had their pensions frozen despite paying in the same dues. Over 90% of affected pensioners live in the Commonwealth countries with close cultural ties to the UK. So the UK is the only country in the OECD to take this two-tier approach to state pensions, and I would ask the, the Minister to reflect on that. Madam Deputy Speaker, we know that there is opposition to this bill from various parts of the House tonight, but it does not just stop in this chamber. Francis O'Grady, the General Secretary of the Trade Union Congress, has said, the UK has one of the least generous state pensions in the developed world. The triple lock was introduced to close this gap and lift pensioners out of poverty. Suspending it will only halt our progress. This is a dangerous precedent. If the government is allowed to pick and choose when to apply the triple lock, the result will be lower state pensions for future generations and more pensioners experiencing hardship. This decision will hit young and old alike. A race to the bottom on pensions helps no one. And she is absolutely right, Mr Deputy Speaker. But I want to finish off with a quote from even closer to home and something I found on the Better Together website, which advocated Scotland voting against independence in 2014. Our pensions are safer as part of the UK. We are living longer and working longer than ever before. People want to know that their pensions are safe, say the Better Together campaign. The UK state pension means that everyone in the UK can get the same basic state pension. It is a great example of how we share the good things across the UK, they said. Not at the moment. We all pay in when we are working and we all benefit when we retire. This means we can support our pensioners in the same way, whether good times or bad. Scotland's people are getting older and faster at a rate than the rest of the UK. This is good, but it means that if we leave the UK, we could have a difficult choice to make, including cutting the state pension. And on that, I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. Can you tell us what the state pension would be in an independent Scotland and what currency would it be paid in? I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for finding the time to come to the House of Commons tonight. I know that he will be balancing his ob obligations. The Honourable Gentleman turned us in a sedentary position. I have already outlined in my earlier speech that we want to have uh, pensions much more in line, for example, to that of Austria and to Luxembourg. So I hope that that answers the Honourable Gentleman's question. Anyway, the SNP will vote to reject this legislation, but, Mr Deputy Speaker, by passing this bill tonight, we will see yet another Better Together myth bust that pensioners are somehow protected by Mother Britannia. To be blunt, allowing this bill to proceed tonight not only violates the contract offered to voters by the Prime Minister and indeed the Honourable Gentleman from Murray in 2019, which won a handsome majority in this place, but it makes a mockery of the No Campaign's claim that Scotland remaining in this broken union is the best deal for UK pensioners when it is patently not. The SNP will vote to reject this legislation this evening, but in truth, we all know that the democratic deficit across these islands means that Scotland's MPs will be outvoted when we try to protect pensioners' incomes. And that's why the only way to truly tackle the plight of pensioner poverty is with Scottish independence, because Westminster isn't working and we need to retire from this United Kingdom. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dr Ben Spencer. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And it's a pleasure to speak in this uh, brief debate. And I think this debate is fundamentally about fairness. When the triple lock was conceived, it wasn't that no one anticipated the pandemic that would lead to mass redundancies of people predominantly on lower pay, which would lead to wage inflation through people losing their jobs and a cash bonanza for pensioners. And I think most pensioners see that doing that and having the 8% or more rise would be fundamentally unfair. And I want to respond to some of the points about trust. And I think that on trust, you earn trust by being open and straightforward about difficult decisions that you have to make and explain where we are 
and why we're doing the things we're doing, ploughing headlong, uh, opposing a manifesto commitment, which is, would be clearly ludicrous in the face of the situation at the moment in terms of uh, average earnings, I think is a way that you would absolutely lose trust uh, in the government and lose trust in terms of competent administration. But I do believe that this should be the start of a debate uh, on the broader utility of the earnings component uh, in the triple lock. Because at the moment, it's twice now that this has been distorted by earnings in the past year. Uh, and there are things we, to make, we need to make sure that we are measuring correctly cost of living, tackling inequalities and pension and poverty. And while I think we can't have that more extensive debate today, a debate on that, I believe, is sorely needed. Wendy Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I speak to the reasoned amendment uh, in the name of the right, my right honourable friend, the member for Kingston and Surbiton. Um, the Government is on track to break yet another of their manifesto promises, another example of how this Government is willing to turn its back on people living in poverty. Now, pensioners, next month it will be those on universal credit. Now, Liberal Democrats want Britain to be the best place to live and retire, and frankly, we would all accept that we know it is far from that. People who have worked hard and paid taxes all their lives deserve a comfortable retirement when the time comes. And it was our party that was instrumental in putting the triple lock in place, providing a lifeline to millions of pensioners who had seen derisory increases of as low as 75 pence per year. When pensions were only pegged to price inflation, their real value had shrunk to one of the lowest in the developed world. We all deserve to live in dignity, to be able to afford food, heating and to be able to live a life with some meaning or enjoyment. And reaching retirement age does and should not change that. There are over 18,000 people in my constituency claiming the state pension, and that's over 20% of the local population. They have worked, paid taxes, raised families and built communities, and I want them to know that they are visible. The Conservative Party clearly don't feel the same about their local pensioners, with the 20 hardest-hit constituencies all being represented by Conservative members, and the Secretary of State's own constituency being the fifth most affected by this broken manifesto commitment. Now, we all accept that we have lived in exceptional times over the past 18 months and the earnings growth this year is out of the ordinary. But the big picture here is that this government is refusing to take any action to lift any group out of poverty. And by refusing to do this, it highlights the hollowness of the phrase levelling up. They are cutting universal credit, taking away vital income from five and a half million households and pushing thousands of families further into uh, poverty. And they have refused throughout to increase legacy benefits at all, ignoring the needs of recipients, a number of the majority of, or, uh, who are disproportionately disabled. Technical issues were given as the reason for this, but 18 months on, a lack of appetite seems to be the more obvious case. Their decision to increase national insurance is a further tax on young people, on working people, on those who have already been hit hardest in this pandemic. Now, we know that people are willing to make sacrifices when it's needed. We've seen that over the pandemic. But a part of that must be seen that we all follow the same rules, that there is a fairness in what is being asked of us, not one rule for them and one rule for us, which is what we see, sadly, time and time again from this government. And this government's habit of breaking its promises makes me very wary of this bill. We might be told that this change is just for one year, but they also promise no increase in tax in their manifesto, and they've just increased national insurance. No matter. Yes, I'll give way. I'm listening with great interest to the Honourable Lady's speech. I just want to ask her whether she agrees with Sir Steve Webb, the esteemed former pensions minister who represented for five years her party in this House, who indicated on the 16th of June that he strongly supported a change that the government, the sort of which the government are now proposing, but she opposes tonight. Uh, I thank the Minister for his intervention. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to respond, given that the Secretary of State did not give me that opportunity. Um, now, I agree we've seen extraordinary circumstances over the past 12 months, including significant increases in wages causing this anomaly. But what this bill fails to do, and I'll have that conversation with uh, my honourable friend Steve Webb, is help those in poverty either of working age through maintaining universal credit or pensioners themselves. Mr Speaker, this bill is only two sections and five subsections long. It fails to address any of the problems with the state pension or to assess the impact of suspending the triple lock. There are already two million pensioners living in poverty, the majority of whom are women and or from black and Asian communities. This bill ignores them and the disproportionate impact that suspending the triple lock will have on people already struggling. No ma the promises made by a party in their manifesto matter. It's the essence of the mandate that they claim. 
Just last week, during the urgent question on transport, the Transport Secretary of State welcomed increases in wages and hoped that they continued and were sustained. And that is the whole point of the triple lock, helping pensions to keep up with the cost of living. Now, women have already been left behind when it comes to state pension. With those born in the 1950s, the WASPy women unfairly penalised by the DWP's failure to properly notify them about the change in pension age. Women who'd worked hard and planned for retirement suddenly finding themselves without either. With women more likely to lie in the state pension than men, this policy is another damaging blow. And if I can say a word, last year I stood and talked about the importance of the triple lock for intergenerational fairness. Because this bill before us is not just of interest to those of state pension age, Mr Deputy Speaker. Unless you truly trust that this government will keep its promise, and there's no evidence of why this will be different from the promises broken over the last two years, then this impacts everyone. Jobs for life and final salary pensions are a thing of the past. It is harder than it has been in recent memory to get onto the housing ladder. It is fair and right that young people today are able to look ahead to a state pension. And if we return to the days of minimal increases to pensions, they will be impacted too. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm asking the House to support the amendment tabled by the Liberal Democrats for all of the reasons uh, 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 outlined. Whilst there's no doubt that the pandemic has required exceptional measures, this bill was an opportunity for government to support poorer pensioners and to right previous wrongs, and it's an opportunity that they've ignored. Why has there been no impact assessment published on how this will affect groups already disadvantaged under the pension system? And I hope that will be addressed in opening remarks. Why does this government continue uh, closing remarks, sorry. Why does this government continue to ignore the needs and wants of ordinary people? And why does this government think anyone will trust them at their word um, over the last few weeks? Mr Deputy Speaker, the public deserve better, better than these broken promises, better than this government, and the two million pensioners living in poverty certainly deserve better than this bill. The original question was that the bill be now read a second time since when an amendment has been proposed as on the order paper. And the question is that the amendment be made. Nigel Mills. Thank you, Speaker. It's a pleasure to speak in this debate. Can I just perhaps start by paying a tribute to the two ministers who left the department in the reshuffle last week? My honourable friend for North Swindon is in his place, my honourable friend for Colchester. I think we may have had our robust scrutiny sessions, but I think all the selected will recognise that both ministers were really very. Uh, fully briefed on their brief. They were very uh, keen on the issues. I think they were both very competent ministers and we wish them both luck in the important jobs they have in future. And we welcome the two new ministers, including my honourable friend member for Macclesfield is in his place. I've enjoyed him being my whip probably more than he enjoyed being my whip and I look forward. I think to be fair, I was in the proxy vote. I think I was the first person to make their whip vote against the government in the COVID proxy uh, period. So maybe he really will be glad to have a different job rather than look forward to that again. But I uh, wish them both all the best in their new roles and we look forward to seeing them soon. Um, I rise to support this bill. I have been calling for around a year for the government to fix what was obviously going to be a problem with the earnings blip mm -hmm. due to the reductions uh, at the start of the pandemic and then the, uh, you know, like, well, at least hoped for rebound this year. So I think it's quite right the government have taken this step and to do it with more than six months notice so pensioners won't be expecting an 8% rise and then have their hopes dashed in, in March. They've now got plenty of warning that that uh, huge rise won't be happening. I think it's clear to most people that actually given what we've seen over the pandemic, people losing their jobs, being on furlough, losing earnings, with all that insecurity, which we hope is past, but you know, we furlough ending in a few weeks' time, we may have a, a furlough round of that. The idea that a promise that was put in place to ensure the state pension kept pace with earnings would deliver an 8% rise in the state pension on top of a 2.5% rise the previous year, well, I think we all expect earnings have done nothing like that. It's, it's not anything remotely the spirit of what this the promise was meant to be. And those of us who, who, like me, strongly believe in the triple lock, I want it to last for a very long time. We need to have a sustainable uh, and reasonable triple lock. And I, I think, actually, had the government tried to plough ahead and retain with this 8% rise issue, that would have been the biggest threat to, to that triple lock in future. I mean, the, the Treasury's eagle eyes would think this was a promise that couldn't really be sustained for the long term. I, I hope we're now clear this is a one-year suspension and that we will then have this this triple lock retained in its current form yeah. in the long term. I think that is the, is the right policy and that is what we promised in our manifesto. I was slightly confused by the opposition's approach to this. They appeared to think you know, that the government wasn't being transparent and was breaking a promise and then accepted that 8% was too high. So it seemed to be suggesting that the government should 
go away and try and find a new definition of earnings, different to the one that's been used for the 10 years of the triple lock, that comes up with a number that's a bit lower than 8% and a bit higher than the 3% or so that inflation will probably give the pensioners. And that would somehow be a fairer, more transparent and more honest thing to say to pensioners, look, we aren't breaking your we've just contrived a new definition that gives us the answer that we think is acceptable. I think that is a, clearly a nonsensical approach. Either you say we stick with the 8% that the law puts in place, or you do what the government is actually doing here and say, look, we can't stick to that measure, let's do something reasonable, let's actually have an inflation or 2.5% whichever is higher this year. That is a, a policy that's clear, a calculation that we can all see and scrutinise, rather than ask the government to go and contrive something that I, I think would necessarily be rather odd and rather artificial. And I suspect we'd end up in a whole lot of court cases where the government tried to defend why it and pick one arbitrary earnings measure rather than another just to produce a number that it was happy with in the first place. I, I can't see how you could produce a robust process in that situation. So while I uh, would have had some sympathy with my wife on the friend member for Chingford's amendment, had it been selected, I do believe the government should be retaining the UC increase at least for the next six months until we, we're sure the pandemic is finished. That amendment isn't here, so I can't have the quandary of voting for that. I will happily support the government in a sensible a measure tonight that saves the public finances an unsustainable increase in the state pension that was never in keeping with the spirit of the, of the promise and I think in the long term preserves the, preserves the triple lock as the right way of protecting state pensions in the long term. Stephen Thames. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to be following the Honourable Gentleman the Member for Amber Valley. He makes a very important contribution to the work of the Select Committee and I want to echo his words of appreciation to the Honourable Member for uh, Swindon North and for Colchester. Uh, and uh, the good wishes that he expressed uh, to them. Um, the bill reduces an increase in the state pension which the government's triple lock policy would have delivered, and I understand why that's being done. But let's not kid ourselves. We do have a growing problem with pensioner poverty after a, a, a quite long sustained improvement following the introduction of pension credit 18 years ago. The charity Independent Age has analysed the government's households below average income statistics and their analysis shows that since 2012 pensioner poverty has started to increase again 18 percent now of pensioners that's over 2 million living in poverty in 2020 after paying housing costs of, uh, of whom over a million are in severe poverty so we do have a significant challenge here and it's one that's getting worse <coughs> of the english regions the problem is particularly acute in London. There's no room for complacency about pensioner poverty. The bill will increase the standard minimum guarantee of pension credit by 2.5% or inflation, whichever is the greater next April. And what I would ask the, the Minister to comment on when he responds is to tell us what the Department will do to increase the take-up of pension credit so that more people can benefit yeah. from that increase. On the most recent figures, only 6 in 10 of those who are eligible for pension credit are claiming it. Only 76% of the total amount of, of money uh, that's available that could have been claimed was claimed. And that's a quite significant part of the problem of why pensioner poverty is rising. So, independent age. Uh, yes, I'm glad to give way. Well, I'm extremely grateful to him for giving way and for making this very important point. In preparation for this debate, I read an incredible stat that in Wales alone, about £214 million of pension credit is not claimed. It's an easy way to deal with the growing tides of pensioner poverty, but also the key thing with pension credit is a gateway to other support. Well, the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right, and, and that, I think, is why Independent Age has called on the Government to research properly who isn't claiming pension credit, draw up a, a plan to increase take up over the next five years. Research by ac academics at Loughborough found that maximising pension credit uptake could lift three in ten pensioners out of poverty and reduce the number living in severe poverty by a half. Um, I asked the Secretary of State when she came to the Select Committee in July whether the Department would bring forward such an action plan. Uh, she replied that there had been a media day of action in June to encourage a pension credit take-up, um, and she said that uh, the department will continue to advertise it in a different way, but she said, I am not anticipating a big action plan, no. Well, that is disappointing, and given that this bill will deny pensioners in an increase, which the government's 
policy appeared to promise, I would ask the Minister to look again at further steps to increase pension credit uh, take-up. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, my name was on the uh, uh, amendment which the Right Honourable uh, Member for uh, Chingford and Woodford Green uh, referred to, and as you've reminded the House, that wasn't selected. But I do want to comment on the point in the Reason Amendment which was selected. Uh, I, I quote that, that the argument there is that we should reject this bill because it fails to increase key benefits, such as making permanent the uplift to universal credit. Uh, so that, I want to pick up that specific uh, point, because as the, uh, the, the, the amendment drafted by the Right Honourable Member pointed out, the money the bill will save the government next year would almost deliver the £20 a week uplift to universal credit next year. Now, many across the House are deeply worried by the plan to remove that uplift next month. The Select Committee's call to at least postpone the removal of the uplift was unanimous, uh, and there is lots of different kinds of worry. Let me just uh, uh, outline them. Firstly, this isn't the right time when the furlough scheme is about to end. We are told that Minister's uh, intention in introducing that uplift was to protect people becoming newly unemployed, but there will be a surge of newly unemployed people when furlough ends. Ministers told the Select Committee last week the government has no estimate of the number of re redundancies that will follow the end of the, the scheme, but the most recent figures showed 1.6 million people furloughed at the end of July. Surely the consideration given to people who, become unemployed, uh, who became unemployed at the start of the first lockdown should be given to those losing their livelihood next week uh, as well. What justification could there be for not treating them uh, in the same way. Second, since the decision uh, to introduce the uplift, and especially in the past month, we've seen a surge of price rises. Uh, September's inflation figure was a record, reflecting in particular increased food prices, uh, and earlier this afternoon the House has been considering current steep increases in energy prices. This cannot be the right time to take £20 a week away from everyone receiving universal credit. We heard evidence recently on the Select Committee of people having to skip meals before the uplift was introduced. Well, their position is going to be a good deal worse if it's taken away in a couple of weeks because the prices they now face are so much higher and have become so much higher just in the last few weeks. And thirdly, what justification can there be for reducing universal credit to a historically low level? If the uplift is taken away, support for unemployed families will be the lowest in real terms for over 30 years. Now, the economy has grown by over 50% in real terms over that period, but we're being asked to agree that support for unemployed families should be no higher at all in real terms than it was 30 years ago. As a proportion of average earnings, support for unemployed families will be the lowest since the modern welfare state was introduced in 1948. The House of Commons Library it tells me it will be lower as a proportion of average earnings than it was when unemployment benefit was first introduced in 1911. The government's priority, we're told, is levelling up. This policy is not levelling up. This is a policy of grinding down. Social Security has a job to do, an important job, which all of us recognise needs to be done. Pushing it inexorably downwards when prices are surging upwards means it cannot do that job. You can't focus on getting a job if you're worrying whether you can afford to eat your next meal. Speaking to the committee last week, uh, ministers from the department could give no reason at all why the government had chosen to set the uh, rate of universal credit so low, other than as a kind of consequence of historical accidents. They said the government had made no assessment of the impact of ending the £20 a week uplift on people claiming, nor of how many people would be pushed into poverty as a result. I note that the Legatum Institute has published research today suggesting the number in poverty will go up by 840,000, uh, including 290,000 children if the uplift is removed. Um, and and the, the government has also made no new estimate of the annual cost of, uh, of keeping the uplift. I'm delighted to give way to the...
I'm, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. Does he agree with me? There's often uh, in the briefings used as a kind of mistake that they talk about this as being an unemployment benefit. It's not, because it combines tax credits and therefore investment in this is more likely to get people through and into work and in great, than taking it out. So that's the point I was going to make, but I wasn't able to. I think the Right Honourable Gentleman makes a very important point, which I uh, 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 agree with. Uh, it's a very vital fact, uh, often not understood, that uh, universal credit is an in-work benefit uh, as well as an out-of-work benefit. And I think 40% of claimants of universal credit are in work. And we've uh, taken evidence on the Select Committee from uh, working parents receiving universal credit who are having quite a hard time at the moment. They're going to have a very, very hard time indeed if they lose the £86 a month, uh, which they will do if the uplift is uh, removed. But the cost of keeping the uplift... Uh, with, with the figure that we're given is £6 billion a year. But, uh, and the Honourable Member for uh, Amber Valley made this point or, or, or drew attention to this point in the Select Committee uh, last week. That figure was calculated when lockdown was still in place. Job vacancies were much lower, so presumably uh, the, the cost will be, uh, would be less uh, in, if uh, the uplift was kept. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, just finally, the bill misses the chance and the, the Liberal Democrats' reasoned amendment gives us, us the opportunity to reflect on this. It the, the, the misses the chance to address this very serious flaw in the, the, the government's current intentions. We are heading into an extremely difficult period for families because of price rises uh, 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 across the board, both working families and unemployed families who depend on universal credit. David Johnson. Deputy Speaker, the triple lock has been a successful policy and it's seen the increase in the basic state pension by 35% since 2011, 2050 pounds in, in cash terms. And importantly, the highest level of the basic state pension in relation to earnings for 34 years. Now, my political interest and awareness grew actually when the last Labour government was in power, because it came to power when I, was, when I was 15. And I well remember the outcry over the 75p a week increase in the basic state pension early on in their term, and the outcry over the 25p a week increase for older pensioners towards the end of their term. So it's important that we get these things right. And the triple lock has been a considerable advance in how we support pensioners. But we are now faced with the interplay of, of two things. Uh, an anomaly as has been touched on in, in earnings, where wages have, have fallen and as a result of furlough and the economic conditions of the pandemic and then sharply risen. And over £400 billion spent on protecting people's jobs and livelihoods, which will need to be paid back. Now, on the triple lock, often a lot of the commentary pits young against old. And as someone whose pre-politics career is, was entirely spent supporting young people, you might expect me to have a, a particular side on that. But actually on this, I think it's the wrong characterisation. Because pensioners are not a group of people who just sit there worrying solely about the, the value of their pensions. They have children and grandchildren whose job prospects they're concerned about. They'll, they'll have relatives who were furloughed who might have otherwise lost their jobs. They'll have people who work in the public sector where unfortunately pay has, has been frozen. They'll be concerned about international aid where we've taken a, a, a difficult decision there as well. And whilst I have had emails from people who are, who are not happy about the decision that has been made about Triple Lock, I've had emails right up to this debate, so from, from quite a while ago, saying it wouldn't be right to give an increase to the basic state pension that's so far above what other people can expect in the context of all the difficult decisions that have been made. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, it was right of the government to introduce the triple lock in 2011. It was right to change the legislation last year so that instead of getting no increase, pensioners still got a 2.5% increase. And it's right to move to a double lock for a year, where in all likelihood pensions will still rise by at least 3%, thanks to, to prices growth. 
And most people, including most pensioners, understand why we're making that decision. And I support the government in doing so. Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr Deputy yeah, yeah. Speaker. Finally, it's official in this bill the government will break its triple lock promise to pensioners. State pension will not increase with earnings in 2022-23 after all. Well, 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 we can hardly be surprised. The commitment to the triple lock can be filed under the same betrayal as the broken pledge not to raise national insurance and the same pledge to maintain the commitment to spend 0.7% of gross national income on development. And these broken pledges fly in the face of yet another pledge from the Prime Minister. The pledge, and I quote, to restore trust in our institutions and in how our democracy operates. Wow. I wonder if anybody in the Treasury bench can tell me how that's going. Uh -huh. However, we're discussing the, the election bill um, later this evening, but we don't need to look at the election. We only need to look at the election bill to see um, what restoring trust is, uh, is worth. Even the government realises, when you look at the contents of the election bill, even the government realised that with the assault on democracy that that bill constitutes, it couldn't really call it the electoral integrity bill anymore because that really would be taking the mickey. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that this particular broken pledge of abandoning the triple lock means that the largest source of income for UK pensioners which, upon which they rely, is an attack on their incomes. Yeah, yeah. Recent indications show that the number of pensioners living in poverty is rising. And I wonder if the government benches can even begin to imagine the anger, the fury, the sense of betrayal from those women born in the 1950s, some of whom have only just qualified for their state pension uh -huh. after so many years of being robbed of it. They finally qualify for it only to find yet a new betrayal, yeah. the abandonment of the triple lock. And that's why we on these benches seek to require the Secretary of State to assess and to be held accountable for the impact that this legislation will have on levels of poverty among pensioners in each of our constituencies. I will stand up for pensioners in North Ayrshire and Arran, just as all of my SNP colleagues will stand up for pensioners in their respective constituencies. Yeah, yeah. That is what we have committed to do, and that is what we will do. It is a cause for shame that this cut is taking place full in the context of the fact that we in the UK have the lowest levels of, propor lowest levels of proportion of pre-retirement wages of all our European neighbours. Yeah. As my honourable friend from Glasgow East, East pointed out, <laughs> UK pensioners receive around a quarter of the average working wage when they retire, whereas pensioners in Austria and Luxembourg receive 90% of the average working wage. When will the UK government devote a similar percentage of its GDP and pensioner benefits to, to pensioner benefits as other advanced economies? Yeah, yeah. The other element to this scandal is that it also takes place in the context of too many workers excluded <coughs> from automatic enrolment into workplace pensions. And the failure to extend this, of course, impacts low earners and disproportionately impacts women, widening further the gender pensions gap. Uh -huh. Why has this not been fully addressed? The state pension remains an important source of income for pensioners living in or at risk of poverty because of the very, very low uptake of pension credit. And I would like to ask the Treasury bench today what steps have been taken to increase uptake of pension credit, something I first raised four years ago. What's been done about that? I suspect, I fear, nothing has been done about that. So much for levelling up. Uh -huh. The government says it's breaking the triple lock, triple lock pledge because this year's earnings measure is, and I quote, skewed and distorted. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I've heard people say the same thing about this government's priorities. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Age UK has expressed real concern that this may not just be a one-off measure, but a sneaky way of ditching the triple lock uh -huh. altogether. Yep. And that might explain why there has been no impact assessment. Mm -hmm. Where is the impact assessment when we have two million pensioners living in poverty 
and the triple lock is abandoned. That is a staggering oversight and complacency on stilts yep. towards pension of poverty. And it's for all those reasons that I support the recent amendment um, from the SNP. This cut falling on pensioners will push more pensioners into poverty. The government knows this. It disadvantages women who are more likely to be poorer in retirement. The government knows this. And it is yet another kick in the teeth for waspy women. Just like the universal credit cut, this government is imposing cuts which it knows will cause real financial distress, but it goes ahead anyway. What does that tell you, Mr Deputy Chair, about the vision of society that they have? The only conclusion which can be drawn is that it doesn't care about the people that it is supposed to serve. There is no other conclusion that can be drawn. This government has no interest in the greater good, only in sectional interests. And that's why inequality is rising. That's why inequality will continue to rise. No wonder, Mr Deputy Speaker, no wonder support for independence is rising. Yeah, yeah. Increasingly, the people of Scotland want no more of this government. Scotland needs a government that governs, governs for all of the people, with all of the powers of an independent country. Yeah, yeah. And that is what the people of Scotland will choose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nick Whitley. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I draw the attention of the House to my entry in the Members' Registry of Financial Interests. Across the country, the British people are waking up to the fact that a Tory promise is an empty promise. From tax hikes on the lowest earners to drastic reductions in our food and environmental standards, and now the triple lock on pensions, this Government has made it absolutely clear that its manifesto commitments just aren't worth the paper that, that's writ that they're written on. This latest U-turn could hardly come at a worse time. Having endured immense suffering during the pandemic, retired people are now being forced to grapple with the fallouts of the government's incompetence. <coughs> From rising inflation, food, food shortages and now soaring energy prices just as we enter the coldest months of the year. And while pensions are being told they must survive on the lowest state pensions in all of Europe, the last Labour government proudly set itself the goal of ending, ending pension of poverty in our country, and when it left office, the number of retired people in poverty was at an historic low. But after, after more than a decade of Conservative governments, nearly a fifth of pensioners are languishing in poverty, with women and paid pensioners disproportionately uh, affected. Now, as the nights draw in and the temperatures begin to fall, many older people in my constituency of Birkenhead will be forced to choose between putting a hot meal on the table or heating their homes. And as they do, they will undoubtedly ask themselves, how can they ever trust this government again? The Secretary of State has justified this measure as a temp temporary response to the extraordinary conditions created by the pandemic and said it's impossible to accurately estimate underlying gains growth. She must now commit to publishing the advice she has been given on this issue. Mr Deputy Speaker, Millions of our people across the country are filled with a sense of dread at the prospect of the coming winter, from overweight and underpaid healthcare workers to families struggling to get on by universal credit. And pensions are not and will not be spared from the cost of living crisis that is engulfing our poorest and most vulnerable communities. But it will be nothing compared to the suffering that will be inflicted on retired people in winters to come if the triple lock is not reinstated again in 2023. As Age UK have warned, we have simply no hope, no hope of tackling pension of poverty without, without an absolute commitment to the triple lock. And so many of my, uh, of my retired constituents look fearfully to the future. I call on the Secretary of State to reaffirm her commitment to the triple lock and to guarantee the House that this will not be the first step in doing away with this vital self-guard altogether. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Gavin Newlands. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, as uh, my honourable friend, the member for Glasgow East, uh, said in his excellent speech from the, the front bench, the UK lag lags far behind most in other industrialised countries when it comes to what its government spends on its older people and their pensions. Most of the EU spends more, the US spends far more, the vast majority of OECD countries spend more. It should be clear that this is not an accident of history or just an outcome of circumstances. It is a result of decades of deliberate policy decisions by governments here, including the current administration. Mm -hmm. I must ask the question, 
Mr Deputy Speaker. What exactly is the point if a triple lock, if at any time the Secretary of State and our Cabinet colleagues can jimmy open and bust open promises that were made not just once but multiple times over many years? Just three months ago, the Prime Minister's official spokesperson, the spokesman told us we are committed to the triple lock when asked the direct question about its removal. That pledge only existed for as long as it actually meant anything. As soon as actual expenditure on pensions was involved, those promises disappeared quicker than a Prime, Minister, Prime Ministerial bridge. Oh. <laughs> this attack on pensioners' living standards shouldn't be looked at in isolation. While the families of many pensioners are hammered by rising energy prices, soaring food prices and shortages, regressive tax rates, scrapping free TV licences and the shameful cuts to universal credit, this is just the latest attack on the social contract and the welfare state. Uh -huh. Those rising energy prices threaten to put more pensioner households in, into fuel poverty, and removing the triple lock will magnify that impact. Already, over half of single pensioners live in fuel poverty, with 13 per cent of older households living in extreme fuel poverty. Those numbers will undoubtedly grow if today's bill is passed. And in a wealthy, energy-rich country like ours, that is an absolute disgrace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not only is this a betrayal of older people around the country, it's economically illiterate. The government is reducing the spending power available in our economy at the very time our industries need that consumer spending as part of the recovery from COVID. That same argument can be made, uh, can be said for the shameful cut in universal credit, which scarcely could be happening at a worse moment for all the reasons I outlined earlier. Moreover, we know that almost every penny of, of that uplift went in directly into the economy because it had to keep food on the table, to clothe their children, to keep the lights on and to stay warm. The government will look back on this moment with deep regret, I guarantee it, that <coughs> political consequences will only be outweighed by the social and human consequences. <coughs> the four and a half billion pounds the government proposed to keep from pensioners is money that could be circulating in our economy, yeah, yeah. supporting jobs and businesses on our high streets, stimulating demand in our producers and manufacturers and supporting the recovery. With this change today, that money will be lost from the economy and lost from the job creating cycle. Yeah. Pensioners in this country, as has been outlined already, should know that what is offered by the UK government and the system they have created is far below almost every EU country. This bill is another attempt to decouple the UK from the European, indeed the global mainstream, and social security as in so many other areas of life. Attacking the welfare state has been this government's hallmark since the, the current Prime Minister came to office, since his predecessor came to office and since her predecessor came to office. Indeed, one can look to the, the books of Tory Prime Ministers going back decades and pick out one ideological attack after another. Yeah. Not least a disgraceful way the UK successive, successive UK governments have treated the WASP women. Yeah. At least if this cut saw the money saved kept in the DWU budget, the government could at least argue they were diverting money to different priorities. I don't ex accept that that would be necessary, but at least have some logic to it. That is not what's happening. And instead, the government's social security policies, combined with the more general havoc we are wreaking on the economy, will leave millions of pensioner households worse off. Uh, in conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, today's bill is more evidence of how the UK's welfare state is becoming something for the history books. Rather than a, a living system, we are a long way, a long, long way from the days of beverage in the five giants. This is not a route we in Scotland wish to continue down. The UK is sowing the seeds of its own demise by providing its own contrast between Ireland that forces pensioners and millions more into deeper and deeper poverty, while the fat cats continue to collect the cream in a Europe where the security of retirement is a fundamental right supported by the state. Yeah. And if you haven't got the gist of it, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'll be voting for the amendment tonight. Yeah. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and, and uh, pleasure to, to speak in this debate and to follow others who have made the, the points fairly clearly. I am supportive of trying to get our finances on an even keel after the massive unexpected expenses of COVID, and yet there is absolutely something within me that balks at what would again seem to be a raid on pensioners' incomes. Is it not so that the library statistics have put forward they outline the potential cost of uprating the triple locked elements of the state pension by 2.5% instead of 8.3% uh, to save five billion in state pension expenditure in 2022-23 seems to be the greater consideration? rather than the fairness and the equity that perhaps government should be giving uh, more indications of the effect, especially on pensioners. I, I did speak to the Minister before, and he, he was very kind to come and, uh, and, and uh, just confirm with me some of the matters. So at, at the end, perhaps, Madam Deputy Speaker, the, the Minister will confirm the impact and how this will affect Northern Ireland, how this process will go forward. But can I say this? Northern Ireland pensioners are paying more for products due to the intransigence of the EU, perhaps, do not, do not need this additional funding. 
just to pay for the shoppery rising costs. We see items that cost one pound just a while ago now cost them one twenty nine. So I believe we need to address the deficit, but this cannot be done thoroughly, uh, over taxing those who have paid all their life by saving them short of the burden more so than those who can afford to pay more. I endorse the Honourable Lady uh, for Ayrshire and Arran who made her comment about the Waspy woman and I very much uh, fall into that category uh, of others and, and, and as she said her words were I think poor in retirement and I see some of my constituents in the very same uh, place as well. So, I'm quite happy to, yes. I, I like to raise a, a, a small group of pensioners who are excluded from the bill, the 4% of UK pensioners who have had their state pensions frozen because they now happen to live in their own country. All pensioners who are paid their dues should be entitled to the full uprated state pension, and yet half a million British pensioners living around the world have been left behind year on year. So would the honourable member agree it's disgraceful to be leaving our pensioners in this situation without dignity, financial security and respect, and that the government needs to address this frozen pension issue. Can I thank the Honourable Lady for, for her uh, intervention and, and would wholeheartedly endorse that. It's always good to have these debates because others bring their, their, their uh, um, and, and knowledge and information and to, to the debate. And quite clearly, the Honourable Lady has highlighted something that needs to be addressed. And perhaps, maybe in conclusion, the Minister can, can give us some indication of that. I, I do believe that we should be cementing and investing and encouraging business growth, which pays into the Treasury in a natural manner. Um, I, 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 the Honourable Lady who, uh, for uh, North East Fife, uh, re, uh, who referred to uh, her amendment, I, 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 again, um, I, I think it, uh, it, it uh, gives some thought as to where perhaps maybe us in this side of the chamber are thinking. Um, uh, the, the topic is a very difficult one. I understand that. I'm aware of the pressures of COVID-19 on the economy and the fact that my grandchildren may well be paying for it throughout their lifetime and perhaps maybe their children's lifetime. However, how we recoup the money is my concern. It cannot be through, through uh, overly taxing those who have paid all their life by seeing them shoulder the burden more so than those who can afford to pay more. I feel that I, uh, it seems to be a slogan in here for me, and I made this last night, is to stop squeezing the middle class. I do believe that we should be uh, investing and encouraging business growth. Um, I, I, again, perhaps the Minister, when, when he comes up to something at the end, uh, could give us some indication, as others have referred to, pension credit. Um, um, there, there wouldn't be an occasion that I don't speak to someone uh, of, of that particular bracket uh, when I'm on the doors or when we're social uh, occasions that we're at, and ask them, are you getting all your benefits? Are you getting your attendance allowance? Are you getting your pension credit? Uh, and, and, and more often than not, unfortunately, Madam Deputy Speaker, many of those people aren't. So, so I think that maybe government has a, has a, a role to play here to ensure that those who do not get the benefit or are not aware of the benefit should be getting it. Uh, so I, again, the House of the Minister can, 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 uh, uh, can remind us of that and, and where we stand. In, in Northern Ireland, uh, the, the, the figures uh, are, are quite, quite scary. 15 per cent of, of pensioners are on, on uh, are in fuel poverty and are po and, and, and overall poverty um, and that's some forty three thousand uh, people uh, who who fit into that category uh, now again that uh, concerns me as well uh, and again maybe the minister can tell us. the honourable gentleman for East Ham referred to as a, 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 a passing to his amendment that wasn't chosen and he referred to the universal credit. Uh, and you're also referred to whenever furlough is ending and many families will find themselves in a difficult position. I subscribe to that as well, as indeed I think probably everyone in this side of the chamber probably has done the same. In Northern Ireland, we're facing gas bill rises of, of some 35% as winter comes in hard. And those who live in, in, in Northern Ireland and housing executive uh, accommodation or housing association accommodation uh, who have been converted to gas find themselves now in a, in, in a double whammy, where it's not just the, 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 the pension credit issue, uh, it's not just the, the issue of, of their pension uh, and how it affects them, it's universal credit. And these people will be squeezed more so than ever. So um, pe uh, pensioners will be impacted uh, uh, um, uh, unfairly. Uh, and, and we can see this one that we'll see increasing pressure on the pensioners, and many others will fall into the category above the 15 per cent. For those who work, uh, as the Honourable Gentleman for East Ham referred to, uh, I, I'm just going to one quick example, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, th this lady, and I quote her, 
You make a third of your money when you do overtime for the benefit you lose. So I'm paid £3 an hour in real terms. She said, whilst I do take the overtime offered to me, I am unable to do it. I can understand why others don't. And making up to £20 a week uh, is not as easy as money would have have us to believe today. So I have a long opposed to the cut, the cut to universal credit, especially coming into wanting when there are additional costs. And for the sake of working families in my constituency, I must add my voice to those calling for the money saved, whether through this pension uh, upgrading change or other methods. The ability for families to afford the gas increase must be a factor in the working out. I close with this comment, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. We are thinking of capping the pension increase. Our most vulnerable sector of people, without a real review into how their living will increase this year, and this is not something which I feel we can comfortably do at this stage with the limited information that has been provided. And as the increase in the cost of living, I think it is honourable gentleman who referred to, uh, for many uh, pensioners, it will be a, a stark choice of whether we have a meal or whether we turn the heat on, uh, and, and those are real cold realities for, for many people. Um, uh, so it's the cost of living, such as food and fuel, which is seeing around 20% rise in Northern Ireland within the next few weeks, then I have to say, with great respect to the Minister and to, to Government, uh, that I have to uh, uh, support my pensioners, to support the amendment that is put forward on this side, and I have to stand with them and to oppose this, because it's not right, and when it's not right, then I can't support it. Yeah. Oh, Jonathan Reynolds. Yeah. Very much. Madam Deputy Speaker, for calling me to close the second reading of the bill today. We have heard many good speeches this afternoon. Before turning to them, I do want to first deal with the central case the Government has made for the legislation today. As my honourable friend from Reading East set out uh, when he opened for us in the debate, on this side of the House, we do accept there has been an anomaly in the earnings data due to the pandemic, and we recognise a solution to that is required. I've listened very carefully to some very passionate speeches across the House this afternoon, but quite simply I have to say to colleagues, I do not believe anyone in the UK right now currently believes wages are rising at 8.3% in real terms across the board. I think if I were to put that case to my constituents, they would question my judgment very much so. However, as we've said from the beginning when this announcement was first made, the duty is on the government to explain why its preferred solution, which is a move to operating by inflation or 2.5%, is the right one. And this duty is particularly important because the triple lock was a Conservative manifesto commitment and the announcement to break it does come after a series of decisions to break other Conservative manifesto commitments, as many members of the House have pointed out. It's therefore reasonable that the burden of proof lies on the Government and the threshold for support for that should be high. Now, in the debate, Madam Deputy Speaker, we heard some very valuable uh, contributions. The member for Glasgow East I think it was right to highlight the uh, issues of trust in the government stemming from the decisions of the last few months. I think he was also right to point out that the figures do show uh, num the number of pensioners living uh, in poverty taken by the measurement he indicated, those living uh, with an income below 60% of the median after their housing costs. That is rising. I think maybe the question for all of us in Parliament today is how is it that when we know overall spending on pensions is going up every year by quite considerable numbers, we're also seeing that rise in poverty. That perhaps is something we need more time on in future. Um, he favours expansion of auto-enrolment. I would very much agree with him on that. I think there's a question as to how to do that in a post-pandemic uh, environment. He will understand, however, that I cannot uh, agree with him when he posits the Scottish independence might be uh, the solution to some of these problems. I think it is yeah, simply yeah. the case to say that an independent Scotland would clearly face some very difficult economic decisions in its own right, and I, I don't think it's necessary, uh, helpful to put that across, and I, I, well, I'll give way to him on that point. But does he accept, yes, an independent Scotland would face difficult economic decisions, but the central point of independence is that people in Scotland, that is the people who live and work there, making those economic decisions? Yeah, yeah. Well, I understand the basis of any sort of nationalist uh, claim for any sense of, of self-determination, but I would just say to him, and it's a debate that maybe stems a little bit away from the pensions upbraiding uh, discussion, Madam Deputy Speaker, that you know, we all live on these islands together, and I think it is clearly the case that when we look at difficult economic decisions, the strength that we have by being a union it, it is, is of benefit to us all, and I think we will, we'll, 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 I'll come to the Honourable Lady's speech, but I, I don't think there's... Uh, time for a debate on Scottish independence as part 
of these pension up ratings. Um, the Honourable Member for Runnymede and Weybridge, he made a brave case that the Government might actually lose trust if it held to its manifesto commitments, but I admired the, the style he did it in. Um, he wants a, a wider debate on the earnings lock. I would respectfully have to disagree with him on that. I do believe there is a need to maintain the value of the state pension and the objectives of the triple lock, I think, uh, are ones we should keep to. And many of the reforms in Parliament since I've been here were based on a provision for the triple lock uh, to take place, but I also uh, did appreciate his speech. Um, the member for Amber Valley, uh, as ever, a thoughtful contribution. He questioned the ability, uh, my honourable friend raises in his opening remarks, to analyse the underlying wage trend taking away the impact of the pandemic. Now, I think he will know that has been an open question. Several organisations have tried to do a piece of work on that, but though I ultimately do agree it is challenging to do so in a way that is therefore unchallengeable. And I, I think, yeah, that's a fair point to make when looking at possible alternatives to this. Um, the member for East Ham, the chair of the uh, Select Committee, he pointed out that uh, pension poverty is rising again, as the Honourable Member for Glasgow East did, and I think that has to be central to our discussions. Um, he, uh, again, uh, made this point repeatedly that the question has to be how we can increase the take-up of pension credit. He's raised this point consistently. I know there's been some engagement with the, the, front, the government uh, front bench on this, but I think there's strong support for his words from all sides whenever he, he raises it. And, of course, I believe he was absolutely uh, right to uh, raise the juxtaposition of the decision today with that cut to universal credit, which I believe the case is getting stronger for every single day to not proceed uh, with the government's uh, cut. Uh, the member for uh, Wantage uh, raised um, pension up ratings uh, in the past. He will, I think, not mind me saying that if we look at the position, say, in 1997 when that Labour government came to power, a third of all pensioners back then lived in poverty. There was a very strong correlation in those days between growing old and being in poverty. And, of course, that was reduced to record levels by the end of that uh, Labour government, record low levels, I should say. And so I think that record has to be considered in uh, the round. Um, but I do agree with him, and I've said this myself, that I, I reject discussion of pension uprating as an issue of intergenerational conflict. I think it is very much about the value of the state pension when today's workers do uh, retire, and we should never forget that. Uh, the member for North uh, Ayrshire and Arran, um, well, she also highlighted the lack of trust stemming from recent uh, government decisions to break successive manifesto uh, commitments. She obviously strongly opposes uh, this measure. Um, I, I think what is required is, is perhaps more engagement with the issue of is the data that we have before us a true and accurate reflection of what we believe is happening in our constituencies. And I've said very clearly to her, I, I don't believe that level of wage growth is the real picture, uh, certainly in a constituency like mine. But uh, where I uh, do agree with her is that um, coming as this decision has after other manifesto commitments have been broken, that is the context in which uh, our constituents will look at what is happening. My honourable friend for Birkenhead, uh, he also reflected on the run of broken promises and how this has come across to the public. I think he's absolutely right on pension of poverty and absolutely right to demand transparency from the government on this decision and commitments to reassure constituents going forward. And the member for Paisley and Renfrewshire North, he raised the cost of living. I think that is a case that is again getting stronger uh, every day. Again, we'll not uh, dwell on it, but I do not believe uh, his analysis of independence is the answer to that. It is the right way forward. And the Honourable Member for uh, Strangford, he was not convinced of the Government's case either. I think he was also right to raise particular issues in Northern Ireland about the post-Brexit trading situation and the impact on, on his uh, people as a result of that, something I think all the House shares concerns on. And, of course, again, he's absolutely right on the impact of that universal credit cut. However, I think there is no doubt that the most uh, valuable contribution, and the one perhaps with the most interest, was from the former Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, the Member for Chingford and Wood Green. Now, Again, we've had it in the debate, something I've said myself, that I do not believe the triple lock is a straightforward question of an intergenerational clash. And I know some people have concerns about the linking of the two issues together. But I also do believe he was right to raise an attempt to try and raise his own reasoned amendment about the impact of that universal credit cut, which we discussed in depth last week. I believe the case against that gets stronger with every single day. And I would appeal to noble lords in the other place, perhaps, to give this matter the due consideration that hasn't quite been possible today but is still very valid. Um, in uh, relation to the reasoned amendment before us, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, moved by the member for North East Fife. Now, uh, this is an opportunity to discuss the wider context in which this decision is being taken place and it does make reference to the universal credit cut which is imminent. However, whilst the uh, amendment 
makes a passing reference to it. Its main argument is really that there has been no anomaly, and that's not the position of the Labour front bench. And I uh, can tell uh, the House I've had my own discussions with the Office for National Statistics, and I am very satisfied that the case for the 8.3% figure is frankly uh, unsound. I know there is an argument for simply insisting on a rise of 8.3%, but I frankly do not believe that is a responsible course of action. When we make the case for the universal credit cut for the government to change course, that's because the government can do so, it is the right decision, and it is very much in the national interest. And I don't think the same factors, frankly, apply to the decision before us today. I think, again, it goes back to whether you ultimately believe that is the correct rate of wage growth, of earnings growth across the economy as a whole. Uh, for that reason, I will not be supporting the reasoned amendment, and I don't see much merit in dividing the House on the second reading of the bill. But we will be seeking to interrogate the Minister in the future stages of the bill and be looking for those reassurances and transparency which we've sought since the original decision and announcement was made, and therefore we look forward to the remaining stages of the bill. Thank you. Minister Guy Offerman. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the 13 colleagues who have contributed in a wide-ranging debate. This bill makes technical changes, Madam Deputy Speaker, to set aside the earnings link for 22-23. We will instead increase the relevant pensions and benefits by at least the higher of inflation, or 2.5 per cent. This approach will ensure pension spending power is preserved and that they are also protected from the higher costs of living. But it will also take into account the difficult decisions elsewhere across uh, public spending. The practical reality, uh, Mr. Madam Deputy Speaker, is that many issues were raised tonight, not least pension of poverty. Uh, and I would respectfully uh, remind the House that pension of poverty is going down, not up. As a result of the triple lock since 2010, the full yearly basic state pension has increased by £2,050 in cash terms. There are 200,000 fewer pensioners in absolute poverty poverty, both before and after housing costs as compared to 2009-10, and material deprivation, an alternative way of measuring uh, poverty, is at an all-time low of 6% of pensioners. And it's worth reminding ourselves, what, one second, it's worth reminding ourselves, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the um, spending on state pension used to be £99 per person when the honourable gentleman was the uh, pensions minister, in fact. Uh, and less than £60 billion when he was the Minister under the Labour Government. It is now up to 137 to 179 and £105 billion. I give way to the Chair. I, I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way. I'm delighted that he's still in his post. Um, he, he talked about pension and poverty. Of course, he's using the absolute measure rather idiosyncratically. The much more widely used measure is the relative measure of poverty. That's what the analysis of independent age is based on. And on that much more widely used measure, of course, pension of poverty is going up. Well, I, I can, I'm not going to repeat the points I've made that I manifestly disagree with him. I also point out you can add on the £24 billion of top-ups that this government puts forward over and above the £105 billion of state pension. So, with respect, we are in disagreement. There is also a significant degree of support in winter fuel, NHS prescriptions, free eye tests, uh, over 75s, free TV licence, and a variety of other matters. The SM oh, no, not for the moment. Uh, the SNP raised many points, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I want to try and address them. No mention was made, surprisingly, of the powers under sections 24, 26, and 28 of the Scotland Act which gives them the powers, of course, to intervene on these matters, should they wish to do so, in respect of the WASPI matters. No mention was made in answer to my honourable friend uh, from Murray, who was asking them what uh, currency would a Scottish uh, independent pension be paid in. No mention was made of the ability to pay Scottish pensions upon independence, because, of course, answer there is none, Madam Deputy Speaker. Now, reference was made to... Uh, pension credit take up, and I want to address the points raised. I'm about to answer the points she raised specifically. Bear with me. So, pension credit take up was raised. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, we are doing a variety of things, whether it is uh, the Pension Credit Awareness Day in June, whether it is the engagement with the BBC. I met the Chief Executive of the BBC only last week, the Stakeholder Roundtable in May, the working group established with all the key. Uh, partners in this matter, the various other different ways that we have changed over 11 million communications uh, to pensioners up and down the country. This is a record that this government is uh, proud of, and I would, without a shadow of a doubt, I will give way because I respect him so much, the Honourable Gentleman for Strangford, for the last time. Thank the, the Minister for giving way. 
Minister, I really appreciate the, the response in relation to pension credit. But in Northern Ireland, we have a consistent 15% of pensioners that are in fuel poverty and, and poverty overall. So, can I ask the Minister, would he be prepared to give extra emphasis for Northern Ireland where, where poverty for pensioners has been consistent and help us need it? Thank you. It is a transfer matter, I'm reminded by the Secretary of State, and he will be aware that pension credit take up is increasing and the amounts that pension credit is uh, going to individuals is going up as well. I, I, I've got to turn very briefly, Madam Deputy Speaker, to the reasoned amendment that was put forward by a solitary Lib Dem. Admittedly, there aren't many of them in 2021, so I understand that. They used to be a serious party, Madam Deputy Speaker, a party that understands the fiscal pressures facing government. Now they're being reduced to a party of protest, let's be blunt, uh, with about 15% of the MPs who conduct their party conference, it seems to me, in the back room of Travel Lodge somewhere on a business park. The practical reality is that the party of Asquith, Gladstone, even Ashdown, uh, is now uh, putting forward uh, something which is devoid of ideas. It is a party of protest, and, and it is not something that we would agree with in any way. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, we are proud of the fact that last year, when we had no obligation to do so, we took the dramatic and important decision to raise state pension by 2.5 per cent. We will be raising state pension by prices or 2.5 per cent when this bill passes, and the pensioners will be protected on an ongoing basis. And I commend this bill to the House. Thank you. The original question was that the bill be now read a second time since when an amendment has been proposed as on the order paper. The question is that the amendment be made. Does many of that opinion say aye? Aye. Of the contrary, no. No. Division. No. Clear the lobby. Order. The question is that the amendment be made. As many as that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Tell us for the ayes, Sarah Alney and Carl Williams. Tell us for the noes, Alan Mack and Scott Mack.
lock the doors. Order! Order! The eyes to the right, 59. The nose to the left, 303. The eyes to the right, 59. The nose to the left, 303, so the nose have it. The nose have it. Unlock. Unlock. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As many as that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. 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 Division. No. Division. Clear the lobby. Yes.
order. The question is, the bill be now read a second time. As many as that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. No. Tell us for the ayes, Alan Mack and Scott Mann. Tell us for the noes, Marion Fellows and Richard Thompson.
Lock the doors! Somebody missing. Ah, oh, yes, she is. That's right. We'll just, we'll just wait. <laughs>
Order! Order! The eyes to the right, 300. The nose to the left, 55. The eyes to the right, 300. The nose to the left, 55. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Unlock. Thank you. Liam. Okay. Social Security, Uprating of Benefits Bill, Committee. I have to say no. Now. now. Order. Order. Before I ask the clerk to read the title of the bill, I should explain that although the chair of the committee would normally sit in the clerk's chair during committee stage, I will remain in the speaker's chair while we still have these screens around the table. Uh, although I will be carrying out the role not of deputy speaker but of chairman of the committee. The occupant of the chair during the committee stage should be addressed as chair of the committee rather than as deputy speaker. Social Security, uprating of benefits bill. We will begin with clause one, stand part, with which it will be convenient to consider clause two of the bill and the selected new clauses as listed on the selection paper. The question is that clause one, stand part of the bill. Minister Guy Opperman. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, this is a short two-clause bill that sets out the respect in which this will go from a triple lock to a double lock. I have set this matter out in second reading in great detail, and I would respectfully beg to move. Matt Rodder. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to speak to the amendments tabled in the name of the member for Oldham and Saddleworth and also in the name of the member for Glasgow East. Madam Chair, as we heard during the second reading of the bill, there are a number of important areas which the government seems to have overlooked. These failures and omissions are part of a pattern of behaviour by the Prime Minister and by his government. They show a casual approach to their responsibilities. As a result of this behaviour, they are undermining trust in the government. The government's approach could have a damaging effect on millions of pensioners and indeed on the public as a whole. So before turning to the amendments, it is worth considering that the government has still not, not offered any reassurance on its commitment to the triple lock in the longer term, and it is still not clear whether ministers are leaving the door open to scrapping this important policy. I would ask the minister that he and the Secretary of State set out a meaningful commitment to the triple lock and that he justifies the decision to remove the earnings link and explains why the government has not found a way to keep this link, such as providing a link to earnings over a longer period of time. With three broken promises in just a few short weeks, the government has little credibility left and it now needs to rebuild its trust in this important area of policy and indeed in its work as a whole. Madam Chair, I want to turn to the amendments. Colleagues across the House are right to raise concerns about pensioners, particularly those on lower incomes. Recent research published by the Joseph Rounty Foundation reiterates this, because whilst there was, and I quote, a dramatic, and I quote, a dramatic reduction in pensioner poverty between 1997 and 2012, the last few years have seen, and this is the words of the Rounty Foundation, this progress unravel. House of Commons library research shows that before housing costs, 19% pension, of pensioners were living in poverty, and indeed, after taking housing costs away, 18% were living in poverty. The problem is much worse for women than for men. Women make up. Interrupt the honourable gentleman. I was a little puzzled following the process. I understood from looking at the screen that we're discussing clause one stand part rather than the amendments to clause one. I just wondered why, precisely, what we were doing here. Um, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his very reasonable point of order, but uh, I have decided that uh, we will, we will uh, although 
the each <laughs> each part of the committee stage stands separately that we will as laid out in the um, paper which should be available in the lobby that we will discuss all matters in one group especially this being a short bill and there being only four separate matters for discussion so the honourable gentleman is absolutely in order to refer to any part of the bill during uh, this part of the proceedings. Mr Rodder. Thank you Madam Chair. Madam Chair in conclusion these are sensible amendments which recognise the risks in the approach being taken by the government. They offer a way of providing important information to ministers and they could indeed alert them to potential problems in the government's approach. These amendments also offer important safeguards for pensioners and I hope the government will consider them thoroughly. Given the government's dreadful record of playing fast and loose with manifesto commitments, it is the very least we can expect from them. Thank you, Madam, uh, Madam yeah. Chair. Debbie Abrams. Thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, and I rise to move new clause one in my name on behalf of my colleagues. Madam uh, Chairman, uh, new clause one is to compel the Secretary of State to assess the impacts of the Social Security Operating Bill on poverty, inequality and subsequently on our health. In particular, uh, I, I request uh, that a report is laid uh, before the House of Commons within six months of the passing of this Act and the effects of the provisions of this Act are considered on socio-economic inequalities and on population groups with protected characteristics as defined uh, by the 2010 Equality Act. Madam Chair, we have heard a lot in recent months, it seems many years now, about levelling up, uh, about building back better. We've even heard from the Prime Minister himself that he supports Professor Sir Michael Marmot's call to build back fairer. But in order to do that, we need for the government to be able to assess whether their policies will actually do that. Now, I know most recently in the Select Committee, um, we heard that it's difficult to do that. Well, I argue very strongly that that's not the case. Uh, and I know that there are many others that will, will argue similarly. The House will recall back in February 2020, Sir Michael uh, published his review into health equity in England 10 years on after his initial study. In this, he revealed that instead of narrowing health inequalities, including how long we are going to live and how long we are going to live in good health, uh, in good health have actually got worse. Most significantly, his analysis showed that unlike the majority of other high-income countries, our life expectancy was flatlining. For the poorest 10% of the country, it was declining, and women were particularly badly affected. We've heard earlier on that uh, 2 million pensioners uh, live in, in, in relative poverty today. It's one in five for women of state pension age. And if you look at women of colour, this is even higher. Black and Asian pensioners are also twice as likely to be living in poverty as white pensioners. Sir Michael also em emphasised that it is uh, predominantly the socioeconomic conditions that people are exposed to, not the NHS, that will determine their health status and how long they live. Analysing the abundant uh, uh, evidence available, he attributed the shorter lives people in poorer areas, including parts of my constituency uh, in Oldham and in the Northwest as a whole, are, pred are predominantly driven by the disproportional government cuts to local public services, including cuts in social security support that they've experienced since 2010. And then the pandemic hit. And as a former public health consultant, I can say this with absolute certainty, it was always a question of when, not if, there was going to be a pandemic. And the lack of pandemic preparedness, going back to the Cygnus report and before, as well as the woeful pandemic management laid bare the pre-pandemic structural inequalities that are rife across this country. Many believe it is the structural inequalities driven by uh, the government cuts that I refer to, including in terms of social security cuts, uh, will be found responsible for the UK's high and unequal COVID death toll. And by this, I'm talking to the, uh, about the fifth worst 
at COVID mortality rate in the world, the worst in the EU. In an early analysis of the reasons for this, Sir Michael's COVID review last December summarised four key pre-pandemic factors that had driven this. Pre-existing and widening inequalities in social and economic conditions, and in particular in power, money and resources. He stated that these inequalities in life had led to inequalities in health. Secondly, our governance and political culture, not just before, but during the pandemic. Sir Michael described this as divisive, damaging social, uh, damaging social cohesion and de-emphasising the importance of the common good. Thirdly, government austerity over the last 10 plus years. He particularly referenced cuts in social security and local authority budgets, including adult and children's social care, public health and education. And then finally, our pre-existing declining poor health. Sir Michael makes a number of recommendations to build back fairer, including increasing the adequacy of social security uh, spending. Our focus tonight has been on the state pensions, and the, but if we look at um, the, the cuts that have been made to working age um, social security support, 36 billion over the last 11 years, and the impact that this is going to have on increasing poverty rates, uh, including uh, given the cut that we're expecting in, in universal credit, this, is, this cannot be underestimated. Improving our health and well-being must be a priority of this government and an outcome of all our policies, including our economic and uh, public spending, including social security. My new clause is about ensuring that the Secretary of State recognises this and publishes a review into the impacts of social security spending on poverty, inequality and ultimately our health. Given that the Prime Minister and the Health Secretary have already stated that they support Sir Michael's recommendations and that this is a means to implement, uh, implement levelling up, I hope the Secretary, Secretary of State will adopt my new clause on the face of the bill. Thank you, Madam. David Linden. Thank you, uh, Dame Eleanor. I will not seek to detain the committee for long tonight, not least because I spoke at second reading. And there are only two amendments before the House uh, to consider in committee this evening. Um, in rising to speak to my uh, new clause 2 in the name of myself and my honourable friends, I also want to offer support for new clause 1 in the name of the Honourable Lady for Oldham East and Saddleworth. In truth, uh, the amendments, though worded differently, seek to do much the same thing, and that is to hold the Tory government's feet to the fire and not simply allow them to stick their head in the sand when it comes to pensioner poverty. Now, I bitterly regret that this bill got a second reading tonight, particularly with the help of uh, Scottish Tory MPs. But as the bill will soon be an act, it is now incumbent upon us to at least ensure that ministers fully understand the sheer impact of such bad legislation over our constituents and the consequences of this government ditching yet another manifesto pledge to pensioners on the triple lock. Did the Honourable Gentleman give way? I'm very happy to give way to my Honourable Gentleman. Thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. I wonder if the Honourable Gentleman would share his disappointment, if he shares my disappointment with the Minister, who earlier in the debate talked about how the Scottish Government should top up uh, the, the, the income that pensioners would be deprived of. And I wonder if he would share my disappointment, given that the Minister knows full well, and if he doesn't, it's worrying, that the Scotland Act Section 24 actually forbids the Scottish Government from topping up pensioner benefits. Yeah. And I quote from the Act, Madam, uh, Ms, Ms, Madam Chair, except by reason of old age, which I'm sure the Minister is well aware of. And does he not also share my view that rather than expecting the Scottish Government to, and the Scottish Parliament to continually clean up the injustices of this Government, we'd be far better off having all the powers to prevent injustices yeah, yeah, in the yeah. first place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very grateful to my honourable friend from North Ayrshire and Arran for that intervention. I would caution the Minister for Pensions that my honourable friend, a former teacher, is not someone whose office or classroom you want to be summoned to for a telling off. But I think that she has quite eloquently just put set the Minister right in what I'm sure was inadvertently misleading the House. I want to return uh, back, uh, Dame Rosie, uh, Dame Eleanor, I beg your pardon, I do apologise. Um, I, I want to return to New Clause 2 because I, I wouldn't want to stray too far from uh, the matters that are before the House. Uh, my New Clause 2 would require the Secretary of State to lay before the House an impact assessment on levels of poverty from the upgrading of state pensions next year by price inflation instead of earnings growth. 
Dame Eleanor, during the Brexit referendum, we were repeatedly told that Parliament would be taking back control. My news clause 2 would merely require ministers to be transparent and lay before Parliament an impact assessment on poverty, which I am sure any responsible government would undertake. So if indeed Parliament is taking back control, then passing this amendment tonight would, I am sure, be no problem at all to the Minister, and I therefore hope that the Minister will not be opposing it this evening. I commend your clause to, to the House. Thank you. Um, Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. The um, answer to the Honourable Gentleman's question is, of course, this is a uh, one-year-only bill, and the triple lock will resume after this bill's duration. In answer to the Honourable Lady and the Honourable Gentleman, in respect of the requirement for report, uh, they should be aware that the Department already collects and publishes a wide range of data in this policy area, which is published annually in the report on the HBAI uh, series. In fact, I have a copy here which is available on gov.uk, the most recent one of dated the 25th of March 2021. And I can assure the House that the Government will continue to publish actual data on public health and poverty as it becomes available, but no specific data would be available by May 2022 as is specifically sought. So in the circumstances, I won't go into the battle over what is the powers under sections 24, 26 and 28, but I can assure the Honourable Lady that I disagree with her view, and I maintain that the powers are there under the Scotland Act, but in the circumstances I would ask Honourable Members to withdraw the amendment. The question is that clause one... Are you telling me differently? No, the question is that Clause 1 stand part of the Bill. As many as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, the question is that Clause 2 stand part of the Bill. As many as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Um, uh, we now come to... Uh, New Clause 1, but I believe that the Honourable Lady has indicated that she wishes to withdraw New Clause 1. Um, is, it your, is it your pleasure that New Clause 1 be withdrawn? Thank you. Uh, we now come to uh, New Clause 2. Uh, Mr Linden to move formally. Madam Deputy Speaker, I know that honourable members who suspended uh, proxy voting and brought back in-person voting will be very keen to vote tonight, so therefore I beg to move new clause two, standing in my name, and that will go for us. The question is that new clause two uh, be... Uh, I beg your pardon? The question is that new clause two be read a second time. As many as that opinion say aye. Of oh, the contrary, no. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. How you doing, big boy? Yeah. Nice. How you doing? Well done. Nice. Back in the old, nice uh... and feedback. Order. The question is that new clause two be read a second time. As many as that opinion say, aye. Aye. 
Of the contrary, no. No. Division. Oh, no. We're not quite there yet. Tell us for the eyes, Richard Thompson and Ronnie Cowan. Tell us for the nose, Scott Mann and Alan Mack.
Lock the doors. Order, order. The eyes to the right, 58. The nose to the left, 304. <coughs> the eyes to the right, 58. The nose to the left, 304. The nose have it, the nose have it. Unlock. Unlock! Thank you. Order, order. That concludes committee stage. Order. Whip to report. I beg to report that the committee has gone through the bill and made no amendment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Third reading. Now. Yeah. The question is that the bill be now read the third time. Minister Guy Ockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg to move. <laughs> Shadow opposition spokesperson. Thank you. As we start this debate on third reading, I want to reflect on what we've discussed so far in this important piece of legislation. The House has considered a number of issues relating to this bill, and we will soon pass it over to the other place. Before we do, we still have an opportunity to improve this legislation and to stand up for the interests of pensioners. Even at this late stage, I would like to ask the Government to consider a series of sensible, helpful points made from across the House. Taken together, these measures could make a substantial difference to this bill. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Government is breaking a manifesto promise. Parties across this House supported the triple lock in their manifestos in 2019. This is a question of trust. 
Breaking their promise on the triple lock is the third time the government has broken a manifesto commitment in just a few weeks. Trust in this government has fallen dramatically, and I'm afraid to say that its reputation is in tatters. Madam Deputy Speaker, we do understand the difficult situation with the anomaly in earnings. However, it is down to the government to find a way to both protect the triple lock and deal with the anomaly in the earnings data. We've asked ministers to take a few simple steps to address this. First of all, to be honest about the data showing a temporary increase in earnings. Secondly, to find a way to address this and maintain the earnings link. And we have suggested using an average rise in earnings over a longer period of time. Thirdly, if they are going to address this anomaly, to report back on the impact on pensioners' incomes and take a real interest in the difficulties faced by millions of pensioners on lower incomes. These, Madam Deputy Speaker, are all sensible measures which should be part of good governance of this country. We discussed this in some detail today. The Government has, uh, must be clearer with pensioners. However, there is no need to take this further today, and we wouldn't want to divide on a third reading. Trust in Government, I should remind the members opposite, is wearing very thin. Let's hope they will now listen to the House and to the public and to show that they are concerned about these important matters. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I already outlined my view on this bill at second reading, and I'm disappointed that the government chose to reject our new clause 2 and commit to the whole House, but I will not go over all ground in the interest of brevity, not least because I'm conscious that we've got more legislation to consider this evening. I want, though, as is custom, to thank all honourable and right honourable members for the good natured, if robust, debate that we have had during the proceedings of the Bill. I also want to thank and pay tribute to the ever helpful clerk of legislation for support, to the, for the advice to myself and our lead researcher for the Bill, Zoe Carr, who will be leaving Westminster for pastures new next month. I hope you will just indulge me for a moment, Madam Deputy Speaker, when I say that Zoe has been a pleasure to work with on the yeah, inclusion yeah. and wellbeing team and will be sorely missed by all of us in the SNP group yeah. in this place. By passing this bill tonight and doing so unamended, this House will enact the very legislation which allows the Government to break its promise to our constituents, namely that there would be a triple lock on pensions. The SNP will continue to stand firm against this Tory Government's attack on the pensions triple lock because we believe that an adequate state pension is essential to ensuring dignity and fairness in retirement. Yeah, yeah. It is clear that the British Government will continue to ride roughshod over our pensioners and so the only way to protect Scotland's pensioners from more Tory austerity is with the full powers of independence. Yeah, and I look yeah. forward yeah, to making yeah. that case yeah. during the upcoming referendum, which we all know is on the horizon. I just wonder yeah, yeah. if the No campaign will be so misleading this time when it comes to pensions, yeah. because if they do, they'll need plenty of polish for their brass necks. Yeah. Yeah. Minister Geyer. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I put on record my thanks to my private office and the policy teams at DWP? Can I also make the point very clear that this is a one-year bill by reason of the pandemic? The triple lock will resume after this bill's duration. We increased state pension by 2.5% last year. We will increase it by 2.5% in prices this year. We spend £129 billion on pensioners. That's £105 billion on uh, state pension and £24 billion on the top-ups uh, benefits. And this government will continue to support pensioners now on an ongoing basis. And on that basis, I commend this bill to the House yeah. of Commons. Yeah, yeah. The question is that the bill be now read the third time. As many as are of that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. no. 